So when you work at a psychoanalytic university, you may be glad or sad, but one basic fact is that we must admit there is a need to found a psychoanalytic university. A need exists because psychoanalysis disappears from public universities in Western Europe and in North America. No one teaches it, no one studies it, students don't learn more or less anything about it, and there is a research paper which shows that the representation of psychoanalytic theories in most influential personality psychology textbooks is outdated and misrepresenting psychoanalysis. So what is wrong? Why is it like that? Of course, there could be many different answers, many different layers to the answer, but I think it would be profoundly psychoanalytic that we look at ourselves and discover what is our responsibility and then try to improve. So because of that, I think this is an inevitable topic. What is psychoanalysis as a science? Is it a science at all? If yes, what kind of a science is it? And how can we improve it? I'm starting with this explanation for the reason that I'm anxious this could be the least interesting of all the lectures that we've planned in this series. I will try to show you some of the answers to the question, how do we know it? So when I tell you unconscious, transference, interpretation, and so on, how do we know that? The basic question I think we should ask in our private lives or in our political activities, but profoundly in science. Not just what do we believe, not just what they tell us, but how do we know it? So it will be more of a methodological, philosophical, and so on. There will not be patients or kids or things that are exciting and inspiring. Let me remind you briefly at the beginning, this is what I started from. The idea that psychoanalysis has many strands, many faces, and so that we should organize a lecture series that would cover psychoanalysis in its different positions. So today we've come to the issue of science. I hope that what we, what we will talk about today will be helpful to, or, to organize and understand what will come. And also I invite you as last week to interrupt me at any moment and ask me questions or provide uh, comments that would make the presentation even more interesting. So today, psychoanalysis as a science. Briefly, I would like to remind you on how we could define a science. It has usually, sciences have a very well-defined subject matter. So astronomy, philology, zoology, botanics, whatever you take, you will know what it is that this science is studying. Then we recognize sciences by their methodology. Sciences have methods that are usually objective and replicable, and many people can see what happened or test my results and then see whether they would get the same similar or completely different results. Science would not work on approximation, on beliefs, on the authority told me, or uh, it is written in the book, so I read it in the book and then I know it. Then sciences must have certain ethical principles. So you should not use your scientific knowledge for purposes which are immoral, or illegal, and finally sciences usually should have some sort of application. In psychology and in psychoanalysis especially, we tend, we hope that what we will discover in our scientific efforts will help us improve our treatments. So we will be able to apply it so that some people will feel better. We don't have time now to go through various sciences so that you can see how it differs, but 
it is probably an illustration that you can make for yourself faster. This is a very important issue in the 21st century as before. So what is a science and what are pseudosciences? So you can see here what are the features of, of a science. So science looks at the evidence. Conclusions come at the end. Pseudoscience concludes at the beginning and then looks for reasons for arguments how to uh, fortify the conclusion. So communism is the best form of social um, organization. And then I look for arguments for it. It is not from up, from bottom to the up, it is pseudoscience is from up to the bottom. So then various forms of criticisms, very important for psychoanalysis. Scientists today hope to publish their work in peer-reviewed journals. So two or three of your colleagues who would be anonymous to you and to whom you would be anonymous would read your paper and give you their criticism. And they will be your best friends. You will like them very much because they will help you improve. Too often in pseudoscience, if you want to criticize anything, then you are a dissident, a non-believer, and so on and so on. Science tends to use precise terminology, even when it isn't so. In astrophysics, for instance, when they talk about black holes and supernovas and hypernovas and so on and so on, they have a meta-language, which is mathematics. They can use any mumbo-jumbo because they can prove what they think with mathematics. Many pseudosciences use the language which is not understandable to people who are outside of the group. In the case of psychoanalysis, for instance, there is a projective identification and there is an introjective identification. And no one in the bloody world has an idea what that means. So you isolate yourself, and then inside your small group, inside your small sect, you use the language, you make it more and more mystifying, and then you lose communication with the others. Scientific claims are always conservative. So you always say, based on my data, and having in mind the limitations of my method, I can conclude that this group of people maybe is similar to that. In pseudoscience, you say, all the people are like this. It will always be like that. It has always been like this. So you use universal phrasing, and you wouldn't be flexible about it. Pseudoscience picks and chooses examples that go in favor of its claims. So I choose seven of the best, seven of the worst, seven that go with my idea. The rest I forget about. I don't mention them. Science tries to look at proper samples and then draw conclusions based on that in the best of cases, on random samples. Then, whether methods are repeatable. So there is something absolutely wonderful that is called poetry or composition. And we are happy to have people like, um, I don't know, Beethoven or Shakespeare. But their methods are unrepeatable. They cannot be considered scientific. They created they had very deep insights. They could understand some psychological processes in a brilliant way. But there is no way to repeat it. Science works with the idea that we can all go to work tomorrow morning and try to make the same experiment, try to make the same research study, and then see what the results would be. Zen pseudoscience is about usually charismatic figures that we mentioned a couple of minutes ago, who work in isolation and transmit their very important message 
to the people who are chosen to follow them. Science is a community of peers who, in the, works, in the words of Isaac Newton, uh, stand on the shoulder of the giants. There were people before you who provided something, then you stand on their shoulders so you can see a little bit further, so the next generation will use your shoulders and so on. There is a serious issue about the logic that we use in these two endeavors, and then there is a serious issue whether you are willing to change or not. We will return to it when we start talking about psychoanalysis. Science cannot be dogmatic. Science always must be open to new evidence and revisions. Whatever we thought was absolutely true, like Newtonian physics, time will pass, someone else will appear, he will introduce a new form of experimentation, we will have new evidence, we will have to revise the theory. Science is very happy, scientists are very happy when they are proven wrong. That means science has made, an, it has made another step and we will have scientific progress. So we'll see how this all, all of this is applicable to psychoanalysis. I hope we will. So briefly, I will try to introduce to you basic ideas of how we could think about sciences. This is a division introduced in the middle of the 19th century that all sciences should be divided into two groups. One is natural sciences, sciences that work by positing hypotheses and then testing them. They use measurement, mathematics, they are replicable, and they tend to come up with laws that are applicable to the universe, to the planet, to the species, to the ecosphere, and so on and so on. So when they come with evidence that all that I drop will fall down, it will not fly in any other direction, it is applicable on this planet and on other planets, in Berlin and in Latin America and wherever. A different type of sciences were called humanities, we call them today, sciences of the mind or of the, of the spirit. These sciences do not use hypothesis, do not use measurement. They are trying to understand and to explain. They are based on understanding and interpretation. This is the modern popular world, hermeneutics. It is based on the Greek word for uh, interpretation. This was a famous uh, text by Aristotle about interpretation. So this group includes historical sciences, language sciences, literary science, law, and some parts of psychology. When you read texts, when you listen to a person and you try to understand what is hidden inside or beneath or between the lines, then you are doing the job of humanities. 1930s, this was introduced into psychology as a difference between nomothetic and ideographic. Nomothetic is the side of psychology which works with large samples and quantitative methodology and tries to come up with laws, nomos. Ideographic is the side of psychology which tries to describe individual cases. So the description is in its name. So some parts of psychology are using qualitative methodology, getting to know one person extremely well. Using that methodology, it is impossible to make predictions in terms of 70% of this population will buy this toothpaste. It is only possible to say this person whom I've come to know so well 
three years from today will graduate and be a very good psychologist. So they are completely, they have completely different focuses. When we think about psychoanalysis and how it developed and when it developed, these are some of the basic trends in philosophy of science that developed in a way in parallel with psychoanalysis. So they were influenced by it, it was influenced by some of them, and some were even formulated as a reaction to psychoanalysis. So the first one comes from the French sociologist who had a German last name. Some say he, his, his name should be pronounced Dürkheim. And he claimed that sciences must be positive. Sciences, all sciences must be based on the premises of natural sciences. So if you want to be considered as a science, then use measurement, use mathematics, use objective and replicable methodology, and whenever you go into interpretation, details, subjectivity, individuals, you're not a science. You may be botanics, so you may be a description of something, or you may be poetry, but you're not science. So law, history, some sides of psychology, and so on and so on, they were just brushed away. Then phenomenology was a very important German contribution coming with Husserl and then in a different way Heidegger. Phenomenology claimed we have to forget about all the preconceptions we might have. Forget your theory, forget your previous knowledge, leave it in the brackets, they used to say, and try to observe the phenomenon as freshly as possible. Try to see what is there and what you see or feel or how you experience it, and then any attempt at explanation must come later. You should be observing the world with very fresh, childish eyes, and then just see what there is. And later on, you'll try to, to explain. In the middle of the 1920s, one American physicist, Bridgman was his last name, came up with the idea that definitions in science must be formulated in such a way that they allow measurement. So these are the operational definitions. So if you define anything by its properties, causes, consequences, whatever, it must be done in such a way that I can measure it. It must be put so that I know which instruments to use and which numbers I might get in the end. So this was very influential in psychology, very deeply present in what is called behaviorism, and psychoanalysis was for decades discredited on the basis that it could not provide definitions which are measurable, so to say. Then Karl Popper, and then probably very deeply influenced by the rise of psychoanalysis, came up with the idea that scientific thinking is what is based on the idea of falsifying. Falsifying in the sense, is it possible for me to make a hypothesis which can be, true, which can be checked, tested, and then proven false? So for instance, he dismissed religion as a scientific topic on the basis of the impossibility to prove that God does not exist. It is not a question whether you can prove that he or she or it or they does exist or do exist. The point is whether you can prove that it does not exist. If your teaching, if your theory is such that it cannot be proven wrong, it is not scientific. Every hypothesis should be formulated in a way that says, if this happens, then this theory is wrong. And then we test whether it will happen or not. Again, deeply impossible in the case of psychoanalysis for the most part of its theory. 
Then postmodern trends, starting 1960s with Michel Foucault, were in fact, in a way, a current of the thinking from the late 19th century, which says there are no true and false interpretations. They are only more and less persuasive interpretations. Who can provide a more persuasive interpretation? He is true. He is correct. We will believe him. But there is no way to follow an interpretation to the line which will say true or false, right or wrong. Based on this came up the idea that every voice deserves to be heard. So starting 1960s, in philosophy and then in social activism, we got movements like Black Pride, and then later on Gay Pride, and then more recently Mad Pride, because university people started realizing that all the voices, all the interpretations are valid, valuable. Non-European, feminine, childish, psychotic, and so on and so on. And so finally, one trend which didn't get many followers, but I think should be mentioned, comes from German-American philosopher Paul Feyerabend, who claimed that any uh, methodological approach that, that makes sense is anarchistic, that there is no difference between scientific and artistic methodology. So whether we do sciences or we do arts, we do basically the same thing. So when you do science, Fire Abbott, I think, will tell you, have fun. Do it in the way that you're inspired that day. So this is very brief and probably didn't do justice to many nuances. But this is the context where we now have to try to uh, put psychoanalysis, to localize it among that. So when we wonder whether psychoanalysis is a science, then we again have to look at these four. What is the subject matter of psychoanalysis? What is its methodology? What about ethical principles in application? Is it possible to see these letters? No? Okay. So this is Freud. This is probably Freud in the middle of the brain. So he says, all my life I tried to unravel the mysteries of the human mind. Absolutely true. Freud worked until the last days when he was 83 years old. He published papers deep in his old age. And probably he was an intellectual as early as seven or eight years old. Uh, his mother provided for him a secluded room in the household where he would be able to read and think in quiet and his sisters were forbidding of for forbidden of piano playing and they say he read Shakespeare in English when he was eight years old. That is, I don't know how many eight years olds we can meet who have heard the word Shakespeare. So all his life he tried. Then here it says, I imagine the system. So that's extremely important. I think absolutely correct. He imagined it. There was some evidence for it, but quite loose. But he was thinking and thinking and thinking, and because he was so highly motivated, then he imagined the system, and this is the system that we will talk about next week, subconscious, conscious, unconscious. It is not correct, but never mind. But it didn't work. So immediately as Freud introduced his first uh, topographical model, he realized there was something wrong with it, and his followers, especially uh, Carl Gustav Jung and Alfred Adler, pointed out there were some mistakes. So here it says, so I created another one. So it doesn't say I revised on the base of, basis of evidence. It doesn't say I tested doesn't say, I develop hypotheses that then other scientists could test. It says, I created another one. So this is id, ego, superego. The model from the 1920s, the second topographical model. 
I only grope for answers. I envy the exact science of mathematicians. There is many authors have written about that there is a complex of physics among psychologists. We would all like to have this very solid science that gives you very solid data. If you have followed, to my mind, the very exciting story of the discovery of gravitational waves several months ago, then the only thing you could feel was envy and the complex of inferiority of your science. In a nutshell, Einstein predicted in 1915 that there must be waves, that, that the gravity travels through the space fabric in waves. There was no way really to measure those waves until probably six or eight months ago. So 100 years after he came up with the idea, the measurement is now there to prove it. Unfortunately, we cannot hope that this will happen with the basic models of psychoanalysis. As I can't see clearly, I, tr I try to pierce the darkness. And I think this is extremely important. You have very strong methods when your subject matter is in a way limited, predictable. The stronger the method, the more limited the subject matter. The moment your subject matter becomes so complicated, as the human mind is, your method must loosen up. Unfortunately, so far, by the year 2016, we didn't come up with an idea how to combine the two. Predictability of stars and planets, predictability of uh, sea currents and so on and so on, is much higher than predictability of human behavior and then predictability of human behavior is much higher than predictability of human unconscious reactions. So here it says, I merely daydream. This is one point I wouldn't agree with. Freud worked with many, many patients. He had a lot of clinical experience and that is a sort of evidence as well. And then he was an avid reader and he knew a lot about history, archaeology and so on and so on. And that is not to be dismissed, I think. I'm never satisfied, which hopefully is the attitude of every, of every scientist. Whatever you do, whatever you discover, whatever you describe, is just one step, just one step on the road that will never end. And finally it says, and now I'm running out of time. Which is a very good message probably on another level for all of us whatever might be the fantasized end of your travel, you will never reach it. The sooner you realize, probably the better. So if we try to transform this cartoon into some sentences, then psychoanalysis is a science which in its aspirations started as a natural science. Then it was about psychological matters. For at least 100 years, it did not study neurons, brain, synapses, and so on and so on. It studied psychological processes. Some were very disappointed about that. Some were very happy about that. But that was the reality. In its expression, psychoanalysis is a form of literature. And it was deeply criticized because of that, but I believe if you read the introductory lectures to psychoanalysis or Freud's case studies, then you feel as if you're reading short stories. Freud was considered for the Nobel Prize, but never for medicine, only for literature. Freud received in the year 1930 the Goethe Prize of the city of Frankfurt for literature, for his incomparably beautiful style of, of his German prose. So psychoanalysis does not express its discoveries in equations, in periodic systems, or in anything that would be a meta-language to, to the everyday observations. 
whenever psychoanalysis tries to do that, like in cases of Lacan or Bion, to my mind, it does not succeed. I may be wrong, but it seems to me that these were not successful attempts. Psychoanalysis was widely criticized for the basic contradiction in its approach. So for decades, psychoanalysts wouldn't do anything else but analyze people or children. So individuals, a limited number of them, in the city where you would live, usually in the beginning people who would be able to pay, and so on and so on. And then you would talk to them for weeks or months or years, and you would get to know everything about the single individual. And probably these were be eight persons at the same time, 12 persons at the same time, probably not more than that. And then psychoanalysis would come up with laws that were supposed to be applicable to, be, to the humankind. So Freud analyzed a limited number of usually well-to-do bourgeois persons from Vienna around the year 1900 and came up, and later on after the World War II, many Americans who wanted to become psychoanalysts and then came up with a theory that he believed was applicable to everyone in the world at that moment and also to all cultures in history. He believed what he discovered was applicable to Shakespeare's Hamlet, to the Oedipus of Sophocles, and never came up with the idea that defense mechanisms maybe didn't exist 5,000 years ago, or they were completely different defense mechanisms, and so on and so on. One of the most important, or at least most exciting, authors in the field of Shakespeare studies, Stephen Greenblatt, has written an essay entitled Psychoanalysis and Renaissance Studies. And he opens the essay with a claim that the basic problem of psychoanalysis is that it is a, histori it is a discipline completely unaware of history, ahistorical. Psychoanalysts believe it was always like it is today. And there is no proof of that, of course. Psychoanalysis is a discipline deeply deterministic. So it is based on the idea that everything what you see in behavior, in your dreams, in the symptoms of your patients, is determined by something. So whatever happens, it does not happen just like that. Where is the source of this determinism? It is in your unconscious. Whatever you do at this moment, whatever you dreamt last night, is somehow determined by unconscious processes that somehow were revealed to you in your dream. It takes a psychoanalyst to help you understand this message that comes from the unconscious so that you would realize what the causes are. So, for instance, remember from the last Thursday the story about Anna O and water. The moment you realize, the moment you remember the causes, everything gets better. But the focus is on a philosophical notion that everything is caused by something. And then you just have long, longer or shorter chains of causes. When you discover one cause, then you realize it is just a consequence of something different. And then you go back into the childhood or back into the childhood of your parents and so on and so on. Psychoanalysis, especially Freudian psychoanalysis, was again criticized for this, because if you follow this idea, free will does not exist. Freud believed, in fact, that whatever you do, your choice of marital partners, your choice of profession, whether you are healthy or ill at a certain moment, when you are going to die, and so on and so on, was caused by unconscious processes and your unconscious choices. And he tried in various papers to explain how the unconscious makes you choose this or that. 
he even believed when you should, when you're in a position that you, you should make a fateful decision. You should not think rationally about it. You should listen to the voice of your unconscious and then follow its advice. Then psychoanalysis as a scientific discipline is deeply, strongly reductionistic. Whatever you see, whatever you observe, can be reduced to something that is more basic. So this is a common idea in natural sciences that chemical phenomena are reduced to physical ones and so on and so on. And in terms of psychoanalysis, we have two forms of reductionism. One that was a deep belief that Freud had and that many people have, it, it sort of resurrected now, is the biological reductionism. Whatever we see as a, a behavior or as a mental state, will one day be explained as a neurological process. So, repression, projection, uh, dreams, uh, drives, whatever, will one day be located somewhere in the brain anatomy and explained as a process in brain physiology. And also, psychoanalysis is a reductionistic discipline in terms of history. Whatever happens today is somehow caused by what happened long ago. Freud believed, and I think probably all psychoanalysts believe today, in what William Wordsworth expressed as a child is a father to the man. So what happens in the first five years, Freud believed, is basically that your character formation is more or less over. Your basic experiences in the first five years of life decide on who you are going to be one day. Then something could ha help you, Freud would say psychoanalysis, to improve or to change or to make it more flexible, in Freud's belief, until you're 40. Once you're 40, Freud would tell you, no more plasticity, no more capacity to change any longer. I've learned last week that the, that the oldest person who ever started psychoanalysis was 99 years old. And she attended psychoanalysis for four years. For Freud, that would be completely unthinkable and unacceptable. That I don't know. That I don't know. I just read a couple of paragraphs. Sorry? <laughs> yes. Well, that's a big thing. Uh, I just read a review about age and psychoanalysis, and, and then I, I learned that. Yes. What? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, depends depends on, 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 on how you defined pretty much. Um, Freud, Freud wrote in the first half of the 20th century. People lived much shorter then than they do now. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease was invented, so to say, in the year 1907. Alzheimer lived and worked in Munich and there were all of a sudden enough old people to notice that there was a special form of dementia. 19th century, 18th century, before that people died young and no one died of Alzheimer's. It did not exist. So Freud probably was more conservative when it comes to this issue than we are today. Then people only recently, psychologists deal with things like lifespan psychology. Only over the last 30 to 40 years, psychology has these theories about development beyond adolescence and so on. So many things, if you think about what is called fluid intelligence, so the intelligence you're born with, basically, your 
your hardware intelligence, so to say. It peaks at 21, 22, 23, and then it declines. Some, some research studies show it declines very quickly, and by the age of 45, you, you cannot compete with 22-year-old guys in the working memory capacity, in the, in, in the reaction time, in the speed with which you process information. You improve in metacognitive skills, you gain experience, you know how to make a shortcut that a young guy wouldn't know, so you, you would not be that um, much slower. But when it comes to personality, we believe that people develop throughout their lives, that they have crisis, that they have problems, that they have mental disorders, but also that they can learn and they can improve. The basic change when it comes to that, I think, came with an extremely important thinker who is, who is very frequently forgotten, Eric Erickson, who was a painter, never had a day of university studies, was analyzed and discovered through his analysis, then uh, had so many honorary doctorates that he was called the doctor of all sciences. And he provided the theory, the first theory of the lifespan development, that there are eight different developmental phases and one goes deep into the old age. So it's very different today in psychology than it was in Freud's time. We know that Wordsworth, Freud, and other guys had quite a good intuition about something from neuropsychology studies which show us that when you follow the brain development, then it is obvious that somewhere around the age of four, a big change happens. The amount of oxygen, sugar, and everything else that brain spends over the first four years will never repeat later on. You learn most, you are most active, you dream most during these first years. Later on, there is one little, uh, you drop down a little bit, and then in the 20s, you start uh, declining strongly. So, psychoanalysis for the most part of the 20th century was a discipline that claimed to be scientific and at the same time despised hypothesis testing. So, psychoanalysts for decades didn't want anything but clinical evidence, reading books, looking at paintings, reading about ancient Egypt, or this or that, but no lab, no university, no natural sciences, nothing of these approaches. Freud never wanted, I think Jung even less than him, to phrase his theory as a set of hypotheses. It was Heinz Kochert who introduced the phrasing beyond the basic rule. The basic rule here is the rule of free association. So the patient on the couch talking about whatever comes through his or her mind. That's the basic rule. Beyond the basic rule would be, can we interpret anything that is outside of the clinical situation? So Kohut himself would write about death in Venice, about music, and things like that. But nothing that would be similar to observation, to experiments, and so on. Nothing that would resemble university or natural sciences. There are two special cases, so to say case studies, not about these persons, but about the attitude psychoanalysts have for a long time. One is about the famous anthropologist, Bronislav Malinowski, who in the 1920s traveled to various faraway islands and met people who grew up and lived in different cultures where he could not observe anything resembling the basic ideas of psychoanalysis like Oedipus complex. So he would find communities where small children would spend daytime with several women. 
And when a child would be hungry and crying, the nearest or the, the first available woman would take the child and breastfeed him. Whether it's her child or, 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 or was born by another woman, they wouldn't care. Children would grow up with the idea of several mothers or fathers being outside of this moment or, 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 or this sub-community, so to say. And when they would reach ages three, four, and five, nothing that would resemble Vienna, Central European, 1900s uh, Oedipus complex could be observed in them. So Melinovsky returned and published his observations. And Freud knew about them and never used them to revise his thinking or his theory. He pretended as if this never happened. When we talk about psychoanalytic understanding of the arts, then I will mention to you Freud's essay on Michelangelo where the same thing happened. When people come to tell him you were wrong, then he pretends this never happened. The opposite. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes. <coughs> yes. Um, a very, very research example for that is America. He despised America so deeply. He went there once and then never returned. He had relatives there, he was invited many times, he had offers, I mean some of them were ridiculous, like they offered him huge amounts of money to come to Hollywood and be like an expert advisor on scripts for romantic movies. But he despised America as something absolutely over-civilized and so on and so on. He was, I mean, not that he liked Vienna. Sorry? Yes. 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 Bernice was the link, yes. Bernice was the person who sent him, who forwarded to him these offers from Cosmopolitan and from Hollywood and so on, and he never accepted any of these. Sorry? Freud? I didn't get the question. For, uh, for other reasons, what? He didn't. Yeah. Yes. 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 But it is not. That is completely right about Bernice. But it is not. Oh, maybe. Maybe I should introduce the topic. So, one of Freud's sisters married one of Freud's wife's brothers. So it is not incest. This is just two couples from different families. So their last name, the Americans pronounce, pronounce it Bernice. So they moved to the United States. They had a son whose name was Edward. And he realized at one moment he had a strange uncle in Vienna who was writing some books. He started reading these books. And he realized his uncle was writing about unconscious motivation. So he thought we could use this idea to manipulate people. So he invented PR. He invented, in a way, he invented marketing. He thought of how we could manipulate the unconscious of people so that we could make them buy something, sell something, vote for someone, and so on and so on. You can see him on Letterman show when he was, I think, 95, and Letterman asks him, Dr. Bernice, what is the secret of your success? And he says, the secret is very simple, before the show, I persuade you to address me as doctor, although I'm not a doctor, but people trust doctors more than they trust ordinary people. That kind of a guy. So Freud never liked him. Freud never wanted to collaborate with him. But before him, so to say, and besides him, he didn't like America, American way of life, cities, cars, noise, and so on and so on. He believed America is the black picture of the future of humankind over-civilized, completely alienated from nature, drives, unconscious, and so on and so on. But to return to this, so Malinowski is one point. I have evidence that you were wrong and you don't want to hear about it. 
But there is a guy in the United States, Rosenzweig, who is some sort of a social psychologist, I think, who writes a letter to Freud and says, Dear Professor, I have experimental evidence from my lab that your theory of the unconscious is correct. And Freud replies very, very, in a very decent way, but basically he says, thank you, but I don't care. Basically he tells him, thank you, but I don't need you. I am so wise, I am so clever, I don't need other people to provide other forms of evidence for me. The basic reasons more and more people believe today is in Freud's attempt to come up with what would be called clinical anthropology. So if you want to think about the humankind, if you want to develop an anthropological theory, then what you need is the clinical method. The basic fact about humans is that there is a gap, there is a split between the conscious and the unconscious, and if you want to understand them, you need a method which can help you understand this gap. Which method is it? It is a psychoanalytic method. So if you want to think anthropologically, if you want to think about humankind, psychoanalysis and Freud must be at the center of your thinking. Yes? This is, yes, I think it is. Because psychological could be, I mean, there are different sides to psychology, so you can approach it in different ways. This one is based on the idea that I tried to express a minute ago. Anthropology, which in its center has psychoanalytic method. So when you look one day, for instance in the year 2016, when you look back at the 20th century, then you will say, whatever we know, we owe it to Freud. There were some wise guys during the 20th century, but Freud was wiser than them all. There is an attempt to think about contemporary psychoanalysis as a science. So, if it is a science, what kind of a science could psychoanalysis be? Some claim it should be considered the natural science. Freud, when he was young, was a research assistant at the Vienna University Medical School with, with a guy from Berlin, Ernst von Bricke, who was a famous neurologist of that time. Freud's dream in his youth was to be a neurologist. Probably 15 years ago, a journal was founded called Neuropsychoanalysis. And these guys who work in this field today, they believe they make a continuation of Freud's dreams. And then probably the most famous tradition is attachment research. So that's now something that is spreading like a wildfire. People who hate psychoanalysis do attachment research. Universities that forbid their, their employees to be in psychoanalysis do attachment research. I'll try to tell you briefly what it is. And then when we talk about development, that will be one of the central topics. This is a drawing that Freud made when he was 22 years old. It is an illustration. At that time, they couldn't photograph what they could see under the microscope. So these were the nerve cells of some very evolutionary, very primitive form of fish. Some claim, and these are some important scientists, that Freud was on the verge of discovering the synapse. 1902, a Spanish physiologist, Ramon y Cajal, received the Nobel Prize for Physiology for discovering the synapse. Some say Freud was very near to it, just he had to break it off. His mentor told him one day that he should give up on the idea of a university career because, as, as they say, anti-Semitism was endemic in Vienna then. Hopefully it's better now. And so, as a person of Jewish origin, Freud would never 
get a professorship. So if you want to get married and to have children in order to raise your family, open a private practice. So Freud's dreams were crushed, but he realized that his mentor was right. I think, and I cannot tell you that I know anyone who so far agrees with me, I think that's the basis for a very complicated relationship between psychoanalysis and universities. When Freud was kicked out of the university, I think his pride and his idea of his own genius was so badly hurt that he made a completely parallel structure of Wednesday societies, International Psychoanalytic Association, psychoanalytic training, which were all outside of the university, like a parallel world to the university. Then he dreamt about neurosciences, but he never worked as a scientist. I think this trauma um, brought it that way. He wrote explicitly, whatever I describe now, whatever I can see in my everyday practice as a GP, one day someone who is in a better position than I am will explain in terms of neurology. All of these processes will be followed to the level of the brain. So this is probably the most famous representative of this tradition now, Professor Mark Solms. Um, his origin is German, but I think he's like a seventh generation in South Africa of the, I don't know whether they should be called colonizers or immigrants or whatever. Yes. You've been at the lecture when he was here in Berlin? Oh, okay. He gave a lecture like three years ago at the IPU about his plantation and how he got to own it and so on and so on. Yes. I mean, they own slaves, no doubt about that. I just didn't know whether they, they went there in order to become colonizers. So, Mark Solms is working on a new edition of Freud's standard edition, so a new translation. Hopefully his capacity to understand both German and English will be superior to, to those who did that before. And also he should uh, be able to introduce and edit neurological papers in a way that is, that is better than previously. So, Solms was trained in London as a neurologist and at the same time as a psychoanalyst. And his idea was that psychoanalysis was so deeply into the mind, but it should be connected to the brain. Mind and brain, as contemporary philosophy understand them, are one. So, psychoanalysis should try to integrate its knowledge with the knowledge of neurosciences. So he's published several books, and as I told you, a journal exists now, and there are more and more people who are working in this field. In Germany as well, there is, there is one, at least one Max Planck Institute in Germany that does neuropsychoanalysis studies from time to time. Uh, he's written several books, and their contribution, I think, is important. Uh, he's famous for his work on neurophysiology of dreaming, and next week we will return to the um, idea of what the id, the ses, is, and then his idea of how it could be conscious. Uh, the pioneer, to the best of my knowledge, of a different psychoanalysis was Rainer Spitz. He was born in Vienna. He grew up in Hungary. I cannot promise it to you, but I think is somehow connected to Ferencian tradition. I, I'm not sure whether he was analyzed by Ferenczi or something like that. Then he immigrated to the United States and worked at the University of, of Denver in Colorado. He founded there a, a lab for developmental psychological research in which later on Robert MD, also a very important psychoanalyst and developmental researcher used to work or, or still does. So Spitz was in the beginning famous for his studies on hospitalism. 
he started observing children who would be separated from their parents and put into hospitals. So for the first time with Spitz, we had a psychoanalyst who was doing systematic observation. He started introducing scientific methodology, a soft one, but a scientific methodology. Spitz is most famous, and if you know his name, then you probably know it for these organizing principles of the psyche. He claimed at the age of eight months, an infant would start smiling to a human face. Oh, excuse me, eight weeks. At the age of eight weeks, two months. So before that, if you show a drawing, and then the features of the human face are ridiculously organized, the child reacts the same as to the basketball, as to the face of his or her mother. No, I'm not improvising. These are really studies. Sorry? Before, before the age 8 to 12 months, whatever you show to the child, the reaction is the same. Physical objects shaped more or less like human face. A drawing of the human face disorganized. Or the actual human face, the reaction is the same. The age of 8 to 12 weeks and the child starts smiling to social objects and does not smile to physical objects. Does not smile to balls, smiles to faces. So we realize at this age some form of social interaction starts. 8 to 12 weeks. Initially he wrote 12, now more and more authors say 8. Then around the age of 8 months, Spitz observed that children would develop something he called separation anxiety. Basically this means, when you observe the behavior, the child starts protesting when the mother wants to go out, and the child starts being afraid when the stranger comes. So we see the ch children do not want separation, and they are afraid of unknown faces, unknown persons. Later on, the mechanism of social referencing was described. Infants, when they want to know whether the stranger who comes is a friend or a foe, they look at the mother's face. And from seeing what's on the face of the mother, they know how to react. And finally, Spitz believed that at the age of 18 months, children start, start understanding what the famous word no means. They start understanding when their parents are trying to prohibit something, and then they might start repeating the word no. That's the idea about the internalization. It was outside, your parents used to tell it to you, then you repeat it in your behavior, then it becomes the part of your personality. So Spitz was the first person who started this scientific approach to psychoanalysis. To my mind, the hero of this idea is John Bowlby. Bowlby was a psychoanalyst, and, and we will return to his name and his work over the weeks to come, who was treated, in, in, the, in, in the words of one of his biographers, as dissidents were treated in Stalin's Soviet Union, because he wanted to make psychoanalysis a natural science. In the London of 1950s and 1960s, that was absolutely unacceptable. So they would stop publishing his papers, they would stop communicating with him, they didn't treat him as a psychoanalyst, although he worked with patients until the end, and he may be the most frequently quoted and, and one of the most important psychoanalysts today. So Bowlby used data from various disciplines that no psychoanalysts considered before that. One was ethology. That was the observation that is a discipline that observes animals in their natural habitats. 
So ethologists do not work in labs, they don't work in zoos, they go out in nature to see how animals live there and how they behave, behave and how they interact. So then one of the things that he used were the famous Harlow experiments. He wanted, yes, and, and also the evolutionary approach. Bowlby's last book, the last book he wrote before he died in 1990, was an intellectual biography of Charles Darwin. So for Bowlby, his intellectual hero was not Freud, it was Darwin. That made him in, into a different kind of a psychoanalyst. So Bowlby tried to develop an object relations theory. I'll try to show you that two weeks from today. How this is an object relations theory that wants to be very natural science-like. But he's based his work on this probably most famous experiment in the history of psychology. Some think the, the most infamous experiment in the history of psychology. Harry Harlow was a very famous behaviorist in the United States. Among his doctoral students were people like Mary Ainsworth and Abraham Maslow and other luminaries. He was a director of a primatology lab at the University of Madison in Wisconsin. And he started a line of experiments that still people are working on, probably 60 years after he started. In the early 1950s, he was on the plane, and he saw a small child that was very anxious, having a doll, I think in his hands, but maybe in her hands. And this was a very soft, warm cloth doll, and the child somehow grew more and more peaceful. And because he was not a psychoanalyst, Harlow didn't wonder about sad childhoods or absent parents or, or internal unconscious mechanisms, objects, and so on and so on. He remembered that in his lab, he would see small monkeys do the same. When they were alone, they would look for a piece of cloth and then hug it, and then they would remain quiet. So Harlow made a design for an experimental study that basically was to choose, to, to, to decide, to tell what is more important. Here is a bottle with milk on a, on a wire mother. The wire mother is not very hospitable, usually she's cold, and you cannot relate to her very much, but she can provide food. Then there is the cloth mother, which is warmer, softer, more gentle, if you will, but she does not provide food. The question is, which one of the two will the young macaque monkey choose? Which one would he prefer? Underneath this dilemma, many people believe, is an experimental study that tells you whether a conflict model or a deficit model, which we discussed last week, is correct. Whether we look for the satisfaction of our drives, in that case, he would prefer the wire mother, or we look for relationships. In that case, the monkey would prefer the cloth mother. No. He wants to say that, he, he wants to test whether it's based on satisfaction of drives. There may be another biological motive that could be uh, in the basis of it, and for Bowlby that was security. Because evolutionary security was extremely important for the, for the species to survive. When, say, 50,000 years old, we lived in nature and, and conditions were rough, and dangers and enemies and predators were many, Bowlby would say it is not hunger, sexuality, and so on. It is security that is the most important biological drive. 
So Harlow raised generations of monkeys in social isolation. Some of them were kept in social isolation for 24 months. They would grow up, we would say, deviant, sometimes even mentally disordered, if they were human. There are very touching photographs of young rhesus monkeys biting their, I should say, hands, probably, like self-harmful behavior. They are fighting, they do not know how to play with the others, you know how monkeys are playful, and they are not interested into mating, into parenthood, and so on and so on. For this reason, many people say that animal rights movement started as a reaction to this experiment. But what is most important for us today? Harlow found, undoubtedly, and you can see this on the films. I can bring the films if you want to see them next time. That young monkeys spend 19 times more time with the cloth mother than with the wire mother. So the monkey would run, hug the cloth mother, after some time still being in contact with her, he would just take some milk and immediately return. In one of the variations of the experiment, he would use a frightening stimulus. So a toy which makes noise, and then the young monkey gets very afraid, runs to the mother, to the cloth mother, hugs her, comes down, and then comes back to fight. Then becomes brave so that he would uh, answer the, th the threat. Of all the variations, so he would introduce the variation static cloth mother, rocking wire mother, and so on and so on. There was just one option when the wire mother would be preferred. For the monkeys until the age of 15 days, and 15 days in monkeys is far, far more time than 15 days for human infants, the wire mother would be preferred when she, in fact, is a, if I can say so, tube mother, so that warm water runs through her so that she's very distinctly warm. So then very small monkeys would run to her and then this warmth would be very important. In all other variations, cloth mother is preferred. So one of Harlow's doctoral students was Stephen Suomi, and Suomi is today the director of this same lab, and they still do this research, and he has come up with extremely important results about super moms and about therapy in a way for these kids that spend time in social isolation and so on and so on. So this is one extremely important, probably the most famous experiment in the history of psychology, never done by psychoanalysts, but uh, we were lucky that some psychoanalysts recognized its importance and that it's part, that it's influenced our tradition now. Yes, of course. So super moms are the adults who used to be socially isolated, deviant, delinquent, and so on. They had no idea how to help them. It turned out they can be helped simply by having time every day to play with peers. Yes. Playing did for them what experimenters couldn't do. So then when they would grow up and overcome these problems caused by the social isolation, they would become super moms. In terms you can give them any other kid, no, 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 no matter how complicated, and they would know how to care about that, that young monkey and how to help him or her overcome the, 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 the problems caused by social isolation. I think the argument is, is the same that we find in attachment research now and that we find in studies with adoptive parents. 
if you manage to, to, to overcome, it, it, it will be probably uh, more obvious when we talk about development. When you, when you manage to overcome the problems, then you not only have the skills that people um, who were not traumatized have, but you have the experience and you exactly know what these kids need. What you needed, you know how to give them. Um, parents who might be very empathetic, very caring, highly motivated and so on, but do not have this experience, do not exactly know what to offer. They would be very glad to offer, but they don't know what. In Finland, they have a social security system which provides for children of psychotic patients who were given to adoption the opportunity that they are adopted by the so-called super parents. When you apply for adoption, you go through the pr process of psychological um, assessment and only the parents chosen by psychologists as most sensitive, most empathetic, most integrated and so on and so on, get to, to adopt these children. The incidence of mental disorder later on in these children is extremely low. It proves that ex especially good parenting can be uh, stronger than genetics. So, Daniel Stern, another very important name, the person who finally managed to integrate psychoanalytic and developmental and academic developmental psychologies. This is his book, I'm sorry, this cannot be read, Interpersonal World of the Infant, published in 1985, and for the next several decades, probably even today, the most frequently quoted psychoanalytic book uh, in the world. Daniel Stern made his revolution by introducing what today is probably extremely simple frame-by-frame -frame analysis. In the late 1960s, it, was, it became possible to buy a video recorder for your lab. So video recorders were not houses, they were just small devices and not too expensive. So they would film mother-infant interaction and they would watch it frame by frame, 24 little pictures per second. They developed a coding system, which now is, is applied regularly at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Institute by Professor Beatrice Beebe. And in fact, when you look at these frame by frame, you see something completely different than when you watch it real time. Coding is extremely demanding. I remember a lecture when Beatrice Beebe said they had 64 mother-infant dyads and she had 14 coders and they worked on it for 10 years. But then you have codes for every muscle movement, hands movement, smiles, legs, shoulders, and so on and so on. So Stern used baby observation and he used experimentation with children as far as possible to come up with data and really provide for the first time a real fusion, not, not that we are two different armies and the wall of China between us, but finally we became one. There are many people who say that psychoanalysis cannot and should not be a natural science, but should be something like a social behavioral science. We don't deal with planets, we don't deal with uh, marine animals, we don't deal with the brain. We should deal with social interactions and behavior. Here, I think, two most important traditions are process and outcome research and individual differences. I will briefly try to, to introduce these to you. So psychotherapy research, on the one hand, may ask questions like, how does the process develop? So two persons meet for the first time in their lives. They continue meeting once or twice or five times a week for 50 minutes. And after a couple of weeks, 
one of these trusts the other more than he or she trusts anyone in the world. How does that develop? Where does that come from? So, people who are into process research use transcripts, verbatim transcripts of psychotherapy sessions, or preferably audio or video recordings. Let me briefly underline it is not patients who complain to being recorded, it is analysts who don't like to be recorded. Then they look at these, and then they measure seconds, and then they measure rhythm, tone of voice, and so on and so on. Pauses, the length of the pose, and so on. One of the first studies of this kind was done in Ulm, in southern Germany, by Helmut Thome and Horst Kechele. They had a patient, Tome had a patient, they call her Amalia X, who came for 515 sessions. They recorded everything, they made transcripts, and Horst Kechele was a visionary who sometime in 1985 realized computers are the future of the mankind, so he hired an IT guy who developed all sorts of softwares for analyzing these transcripts. So based on that, you can take session 42, 57, and so on. Or you can fo follow sessions 51 to 56. Or you can say, I want sessions where the father is mentioned. And then you look what happens there. What precedes crying? What follows crying? What happens when they both start laughing? And so on and so on. Professor Michal Buchholz from the IPU has an idea that this kind of process research can be used for making, I call it a periodic system, of TPSs, typical problematic situations. That if we read and think about a huge number of sessions, we would be able to come up with a list of typical problematic situations in psychotherapy. So you don't know what to do when you say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then the patient realizes it's fake. The patient realizes you don't know what to do, but you don't feel comfortable to say. And so on. I hope this, is, this will be an important line of research in future. There are independent lines that, that people are working on recently, supervision research. So when you go for your psychoanalytic training, you're required to talk to someone who is more experienced, then you bring verbatim your sessions there and this person tells you if you've made mistakes, if he or she has other ideas and so on. Is it really helpful? No one ever tested. When is it helpful? What is the better way? Is it very important that you read or you should fantasize or this or that? And then training research. Do people really improve during their training? You start learning to become a psychoanalyst, and then you learn about books and theories and Freud and Freud and Freud, but do you become more empathetic? Do you become more mature? Do you understand people better? Is your perception more sensitive and so on and so on? Studies like that more or less do not exist. And they, I think, start, they are starting in the German-speaking world, and I'm not aware of any English uh, language studies about that. Then there is another tradition, which I must admit started in cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT guys, for decades, were very proud that they had empirical data showing that they were effective. What they did was helping people. Psychoanalysts, for decades, were very derisive toward that. They felt it was beneath their level. Of course, psychoanalysis was helpful. Look at how many people come to us, and so on and so on. Then, in the period, I think, between mid-1970s and mid-1990s, psychoanalysis started disappearing. In the United States, in England, and many other countries, insurance companies would cover for CBT, would not cover for psychoanalysis. Research grants, psychology departments, medical schools, they all would belong to CBT guys, psychoanalysis started disappearing. 
So several persons realized if we want to survive, we must do outcome research and prove that we are helpful. If you claim that you're helpful, then the question is, I mean, you must be honest and say, no one has a medicine for everything. So who is it that we are helpful for? Can we use psychoanalysis or any other psychotherapy method for all kinds of disorders, for all kinds of persons? Does it work with children, with adults, with elderly, with adolescents, or just with some of them, with men, as with women, in Berlin, as in Indonesia, and so on and so on. With schizophrenia, as with obsessive disorder, as with depression, and so on. Then the question is, if psychoanalysis helps, are there some therapists who help better than some others? Could it be women better therapists than men? That could be an intuition of many persons. Could it be better trained? Could it be longer analyzed? Could it be uh, longer supervised? And so on and so on. Then... Yes. When Well, Freud, Jung, Freud was upset about Jung for, for different reasons. It's difficult to say why. I think it's difficult to say why. Psychoanalysis, I mean, Freud mystified very much, and then Melanie Klein mystified more than anyone. Psychoanalysis today, if it wants to survive at psychology departments and medical schools, it grows toward natural sciences. No doubt about that. At the same time, psychoanalysis is extremely popular in what in the States is called liberal, liberal arts and sciences. So if you want to write a PhD in film analysis, in gender studies, in cultural studies, and something like that, then probably it is unimaginable without Lacan, uh, without many literary scholars who became psychoanalysts and so on. So psychoanalysis at this moment is stronger in soft parts of the university and it wants to survive in hard parts and then it adapts to natural scientific approach. 1990s in the United States were the so-called decade of the brain. If you wanted to get grants for research, you had to do something about the brain. So neuropsychoanalysis was one of the results. A very important question is how do we know all this? So now there are specific research designs that are used so that we would be able to know that. One idea is when you compare psychotherapists. So you have a group of 100 borderline patients and you want to see which psychotherapy helps most. Then you assign them to different psychotherapists randomly. So that's called RCT. And then in the end you look which group will improve most. When you compare that, this is, this is a detail I hope you won't mind. Sometimes people report about statistical significance. So it's statistically significant difference between these two groups at the outcome. But statistical differences sometimes work on the basis of large sample and tell us nothing about clinical significance. So a completely new measure called effect size was introduced just for this reason, to see how clinically would the change be relevant, beyond the statistical relevance. When it comes to individual differences, then there are many psychologists who are psychoanalysts and who work at different labs, who work on experimental studies 
about the unconscious. One, one very important of these is led by Howard Shevrin in Michigan. There are different sorts of experiments that can tell you that the unconscious could influence something. People are doing simple cognitive tasks and then with a very, very short exposition, they see a photograph of something or they see a word which we believe should induce an emotion in them. So you are doing eight times seven and very briefly so that you are not consciously aware of that, I'm showing you photographs that should induce horror, that should induce fear, that should induce sexual arousal in you. And then we see whether anything changes in your math capacity. So there is a huge line of research in cognitive psychology called dual process theory about implicit and explicit cognitive processes that was described by Freud in 1911 and people are doing the research about the unconscious thinking now in cognitive psychology, just they wouldn't explicitly connect it to Freud. Then there are individual differences, studies about empathy, the attachment patterns that we'll talk about, um, empathy studies show, for instance, women always superior to men. We see differences between different cultures, and so on and so on. The third answer to the question, what kind of a science is psychoanalysis, is that psychoanalysis is a hermeneutical science. So that it's, in a way, a combination of the two that Diltai proposed in the 19th century. So you see how it is expressed and you see the name of more or less the only person who claimed that, but it exists and should be included in these lists. And finally, there is a huge group of psychoanalysts, probably still the majority, and 50 years or 100 years ago, absolutely the majority. People who believe that psychoanalysis is a hermeneutic discipline, which deals with very subjective things, with very intimate experiences that are revealed in a mysterious process called transference analysis, and that this is something absolutely unrepeatable, that this cannot be a science, and we should not try to make it a science. So this is what we work on when we interpret dreams of our patients, when we interpret symptoms and so on, and this is what we do when we work in the cultural studies field. We try to understand and to interpret something. There is a dream of consilience. It, it comes, it originates with uh, a, a philosopher of science whose name is Wilson, and Peter Rudnitsky introduced it into the world of psychoanalysis. So this is a hope that we will manage to integrate natural sciences and the humanities. Rudnitsky did a series of interviews with people very important for the history of psychoanalysis of the last decades. So Frank Soloway included, Mary Ainsworth included, uh, and so on and so on. And one of them is Eric Kandel, a physiologist who worked on um, the molecular basis of long-term memory, but who was psychoanalysis friendly, so to say, for all his life. So in this interview with Kandel happened something that I, I consider very valuable. Kandel says neurosciences cannot understand what they have discovered without the humanities. We come up with something, but unless we are helped by, by the guys from the humanities, we cannot understand what it is. There are some molecules, there are some synapses, there are some cells, but what does it say to the world? We don't know. Finally, I would like to recommend you something. It's called Research Training in Psychoanalysis. It takes place once a year for years in London, at the University College London. Now it travels around the world. Last year it was in Buenos Aires. I don't know about this year, but at the website of the IPA it can be found. One form of it every spring at Yale, one form of it every March in Frankfurt at the Sigmund Freud Institute. So this is a group of mentors at the year 2009 when I was a fellow there. And you present your research projects and then you have supervisions 
and you can talk to these guys who are extremely experienced in research and who are very generous because their basic idea is we want psychoanalysis to survive, but it will not survive without research and without connection to the university. So many of the people I've mentioned so far, and I will mention, are there. Peter Fonagy, Horst Kechle, Bob MD, and, and the other luminaries. I thank you for surviving this probably most boring of the topics that we will talk about. Next week, we should turn to what psychoanalysis is as a personality theory, and then hopefully we will be able to use this to ask the question, how do we know? When I try to present you different models, then think about methodological issues and about scientific issues to, to realize how we know what we claim to know. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions or comments.